This was his father and this was his mother. But of Henry Edward John, the third Baron Stanley of Alderley, this engraving is the only clue to what he looked like. Not very illuminating. The memorial lies here in St Mary's Church at Nether Alderley, where Henry Stanley's family had been lords of the manor since the middle of the 15th century. This is known as the Stanley Pew, and it's where the Stanley family would have sat for uh, morning prayers and when they attended services. Um, it has an external um, entrance, so they wouldn't have to mix with the hoi polloi down here. Um, and I think the message of this is we're the top dog, we're in charge, you can't get anywhere higher in the church. And they're very much looking down on all they survey. So I think it's very clear in the message it communicates. Young Henry wanted a job in Parliament, but his family persuaded him to move to Constantinople to work with the diplomatic service. Here he began his love affair with Eastern culture. Over the next decade, he travelled through Asia, learning Arabic, Turkish, Persian and Chinese. Lord Stanley lived here in Alderley Park, the land you see around me and miles more of it was owned by his family. Now it's owned by pharmaceutical giant AstraZeneca. This is beautiful, the Stanley's Ballroom. Imagine this, only lit by candles, live musicians in the corner, house guests dancing the night away, servants tending to your every needs. Now it's used as a conference room by AstraZeneca. At the age of 35, Henry rejected Christianity and converted to Islam, a truly remarkable step for the age. It's believed he took the name Abdur Rahman. But according to local historian Claire Pye, it wasn't the only secret he'd kept from his bewildered parents. Henry went to his mother and told her that he'd been married for seven years to a Spanish lady called Fabia. Well, everybody was absolutely gobsmacked by this as you might expect and old lady stanley in particular was extremely upset because fabia was already married her husband was still living when she married henry so it was bigamous on on fabia's side not on henry's As a Muslim, Henry's religious beliefs meant he couldn't allow the sale of alcohol on his land. So, without discussion, he shut the four public houses on the estate. The eagle and child lay on the old main road between Manchester and London and had played host to weary travellers. So, Janet, you used to live here then? Yes, yeah, I owned the property from the mid early 90s right the way through to about a year ago. Lord Stanley closed this place down though, didn't he? At the time, it was a bit of a sense of loss, really. A couple of hundred years ago, the closure of something that was so fundamental to the community would have been drastic. You know, it was a real sense of loss. It's like the death or the bereavement of a section of the community, really. So Lord Stanley had the power? He had absolute power. I mean, it was his land, it's his rules, his home, his house. He just said what goes and the community had to go with it. End of story. Britain's Islamic heritage began in Liverpool with the country's first mosque at number eight, Broom Terrace. It was set up by William Quilliam, a Liverpool lawyer who became a Muslim after visiting Morocco. He took the name Sheikh Abdullah Quilliam. For a short period, the Liverpool Muslim Institute became Britain's centre of Islam. Abdullah Quilliam helped convert about 600 people. 
Henry would make the trip from Cheshire to attend prayers here, a journey that wouldn't have been undertaken lightly. Just looking around, it's hard to believe that this was the first ever mosque in the country. Abdullah Kuliam opened this mosque in 1889 on Christmas Day. Henry Stanley, now Abdul Rahman, succeeded his father as Lord Stanley in 1869, becoming the first Muslim peer of the House of Lords. He died in 1903, aged 76, and Quilliam led the Islamic funeral. If you look carefully, you can just about see an archway, one of the original features of this mosque. Now, Lord Stanley's body would have been brought through that archway into the main mosque here. His body would have been washed the Islamic way and funeral prayer services known Islamically as the Janazah held here. The congregation would have faced that way towards Mecca. Then his body taken all the way to Cheshire for his burial. Well, he's not buried here in the churchyard. He's buried down the road, down the A34, um, in a little wood. Have you ever been? No, because it's on private land. Shall we go and see if we can have a look? I think that would be great, yes. A few phone calls, some local knowledge, a bit of trekking and Eureka. A magnificent moment. Right. Just watch out. There's yep. lots of We've agreed with the landowner's request sure not to reveal the there. exact location for the sake of privacy. Oh, look, there it is. Oh, my goodness, yes. It's far bigger than I thought. Yes, it isn't it? And he was buried facing Mecca, I'm presuming. I presume so, yes. Let's have a look down here. See what it see says. See if there's anything on here. See what it says. Oh, oh yes. Henry... Edward John, 3rd Baron Stanley of Alderley, July 18 something, December 1903. Which we know was when he died. Yes, isn't that great? Do you know much about the funeral service and how that was held? We know that they contacted the Turkish embassy because the first secretary came up for the funeral and uh, he brought the Iman with, an Iman with him who said the final prayers here at the graveside. But this place isn't within the grounds of the house as such, it's is it? It's not in the park, no, but it is on Alderley land. So you could say that he was buried on home territory. And this place, I think, is a lovely, peaceful place to be buried. I think maybe we should leave Lord Stanley in peace now. I think so, yes, yes. Nazia Mogra and the story of Lord Stanley. Restoration work on the mosque in Liverpool is due to finish by Christmas. Now, don't forget, you can catch us again on the BBC iPlayer, but we're back next Monday at 7.30 on BBC One. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>